Excuse me. Um, if I greet you as we go or we speak, um, please know that I am a handshaker, fist bumper, and hugger, but I've had a cold for a few days, so I will just greet you from afar. <laughs> Thank you for letting me speak today, um, and it's particularly helpful, I think, to be able to lay what Justo said next to what I want to talk to you about. <clears throat> Data um, is so important, and it does direct us, it helps our thinking, and um, guides our action. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, along with that, I think, is story. And story is one of the primary things that Racial Justice League is about. Um, the, a word that Justo used was framework. That that's what the United Way provides a framework, like a skeleton. Um, and I think the people who populate that framework are like the muscles and the sinews of that body. And it is ready to go, but what it needs is life. What it needs is spirit and motivation. This is directly, if you are a person of faith, then you may have heard these words used before. I think that the stories we tell one another when we know one another, when we know them personally, that's what motivates us and moves us to do things, moves us to be different. Data directs us, but the narratives, the personal relationships move us. And so I think the two are not in opposition to each other, but they are complementary to each other. Um, I wanted to introduce myself just a little bit. Bill started, um, I am a high school teacher and an ordained Presbyterian pastor in the Presbyterian Church USA. I was born in Augusta, Georgia, and I went to college um, in North Carolina at Davidson College. I met my wife, Carolyn, there. Um, and we've been married for 34 years. She's the pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church. We have three children, two daughters, 27 and 29, and a son who's 17 years old, a senior who's going to graduate, we hope and think, this year <laughs> from uh, Emerald High School. And we moved to Greenwood three and a half years ago. There is some data about me. And now you know about me, but except for a handful of people in the room, I would say you don't know me because there is data, there's information, but there's no story. And so I would tell you a little bit about me in a story about when I got my first drumsticks. So I was about, I must have been about nine years old. Well, even before that, when I was in second grade, I wanted to play the drums. And my mom and dad said, no. <laughs> you have to go through the obligatory years of piano lessons. And I endured that. And then the piano lessons ended. And I went without an instrument for a while. My older brother was starting middle school. And I don't know how it came about, but he wanted a saxophone. Well, we all, our family is musical. I love music. And so I followed them along to the music store and my brother got a beautiful Selmer tenor saxophone. We were standing there at the corner talking to the dealer and looking at, at things and, and, and that was beautiful. But as they were working things out, I went over to this other counter and display and there were drumsticks there. And there was a little rubber practice pad Something you can hit with a drumstick and it really makes very little noise. My, my dad liked that, the little noise part. And so my brother had just gotten this lovely $500 saxophone and I wanted, I wanted some drums. And so I got a practice pad, which was $7, and a pair of sticks, which were three. And I was as happy as my older brother who left. I went home and my older brother, he got lessons to learn how to play the saxophone for Mr. Stone. Mr. Stone was in a trailer outside the music store and he would give lessons just all afternoon and evening to kids. 
Well, my dad said, well, as long as we, he's got the drumsticks, let's, uh, let's have Philip take lessons right after Alan. And I did that for a year. And Mr. Stone said to me after about a year, he said, well, next time when you're playing this at home, I want you to do this with your drum. And I said, oh, I, I practice on a practice pad. And he said, I, I get that, I understand that, but, but now I want you to practice with your drum. And I said, but I don't have a drum. He said, you've been, you've been practicing and playing for a year, but you don't have a drum? I said, no. When my lesson was over, Mr. Stone went out in the parking lot. It must have been fall because it was kind of dark. And he was over in the corner of the parking lot talking to my dad. And about a week later, I had a drum set. A hundred dollar drum, used drum set. And it was one of the greatest things in my life. And now, 48 years later, I still play the drums every chance I get. Now, now you don't just know things about me. You know me a little bit because of this narrative, because of this story. It's not just facts. You know actually one important thing perhaps about me, which is that when I set my heart on something, I don't let go of it. Well, one thing I set my heart on in college was this idea of race and racial equality and the problem of racial injustice. I set my heart on that and I have not let go. Um, and I can tell you in the year 2000, there were a group of people who came together after George Floyd's murder. Um, this community in Greenwood had pastors and lay folk who met in this very room very concerned because that was not the first time. That was 2020 and we had been seeing videos since Michael Brown of this type of tragedy. But one thing that I found was when I joined this group in this room that there were other people, that there was a community of people that I could be with to talk about this and I could learn and I have continued to learn every step of the way. Well, it turns out that the community that was meeting here was interested in um, doing good things in the community and having white folk and black folk get together and do them side by side. But the more that we did that, the less time there was for story the less time there was for discussion about what concerns there are and what the problems are. And those were the very things that motivated me. I am interested in narrative, interested in story, and, and as story and education got more marginalized, a handful of us that were in the meetings here said, we have to be able to meet and talk about what has happened. We have to hear stories. And so that was about two years ago. And that is the group that became the Racial Justice League. There is more data, data, there are more facts in the handout that Bill passed out just a moment ago. Um, it talks about who we are. Actually, there's some facts on there that, that I hope you see about when we are meeting for community discussions on the front. But our vision, our vision is a just and equitable society for all persons in the United States, expressed most directly in South Carolina and the community of Greenwood County. It's, it's a, a vision statement that fits beautifully in what Justo, Justo presented to us. Um, very similar. But whereas United Way is working at this from an organizational standpoint on a wide range of issues, the Racial Justice League is working on it from a personal relationship standpoint so that we, know, not, so that we not only know about one another, but that we know one another.
The Racial Justice League has worked to make a safe space, not just physically safe, but emotionally safe, where someone can come and talk about what their experience has been of racism or racial injustice, where I can tell them about my sheltered upbringing in Augusta, Georgia, and someone else from Greenwood County can tell about their segregated experience here in Greenwood County. But we do not simply look at our past, we talk about the present, because this is the time we need to be community together and for things to change. We are particularly focused on racial issues. That doesn't mean that they're not other concerns. Often these concerns overlap, but because of the history of our nation, our state, and our county, we need to say there are stories that have to be told here and now. I'm gonna give you uh, another story, another example. Well, before I do that, let me just say, the things that we are working on are conversation, that is our storytelling, and education. What are the circumstances around the stories in our society, in our culture, in our education? And then collaboration. Racial Justice League wants to work with the Democratic Party, wants to work with um, the United Way, wants to work with other organizations because we cannot do it alone, but we do know that when we have relationships with other people, that we can provide that motivation that really moves us forward. It becomes a passion that we will hang on to. When we take it to heart, we don't let it go. The next piece then is action, and that happens with the community. I wanna, I wanna close with this one last story that I read in the newspaper yesterday. Um, it's about Bobby Wilson. Did anybody read a, a story in the newspaper about Bobby Wilson? Yes? <laughs> well, um, this is about a young girl, a nine-year-old, um, who, who heard something in the news and wanted to do something about it, who heard that there was an invasive species called the spotted lantern moth that had been brought into this country and was causing real problems in the Northeast. And uh, there are scientists and organizations that had said, you know, that these things need to be eradicated because they are destroying trees and crops and they have no natural predators here in the US. They've come in, we don't know how or where, but it's causing a problem. And this little girl said, I'm gonna do something about it. And so she went out stomping on them. And not only that, she found a solution that she could spray. It was just water and detergent and a little vinegar. And if she sprayed it on them, it would immobilize them. And she could stomp on them. She also collected some and she would study them. And she brought them into school. But at one point, when she was out, she made an agreement with her mom. She would be safe. She would not talk to strangers. She would stay within a circle, a certain radius of their home. She was doing what she could in her space, right? And so she went out with her, her spray bottle and her, her thing to collect these bugs. And that was a good thing. She was empowered. She was helping the community, a nine-year-old. It's what we all want. The twist is that there was someone who called 911 when they saw her outside. They called the non-emergency um, report service because they saw a little black lady walking around spraying stuff on trees and sidewalks. A nine-year-old girl, a little black lady. We found out later, it said that she was wearing a hoodie. The recording also said, I don't know what the hell she's doing, it scares me though. So, this was in, on October 22nd. 
So this was five months ago. This is not a long time ago. It is far away, it is in New Jersey. If we think things are so different in New Jersey than right here, perhaps what we need to do is tell some more stories. Perhaps what I need to do is listen to some more stories. Because as I have listened, things are not so different here. If that little girl who was identified as a little black woman had perhaps been a tall black boy and someone who was on a neighborhood watch had seen that and had been scared, we, would might, we might not have a Bobby Wilson type story. We might have a Trayvon Martin type story. And the fact that this happened somewhere else does not mean those things are not happening here. And we need to, to be motivated through the listening and telling of our stories about change, about how we change heads and hearts. These community conversations that we're gonna have February 7th, February 21st, and February 28th in, at the National Legion Hall, the hut, at 5.30, each, each of those nights is specifically so that we can continue the conversations more broadly in the community that the Racial Justice League has been working on for two years. And you are invited and encouraged. I have set my heart on this type of relationship building and storytelling, and so I just won't let it go. And I hope that you will come and join us on those nights the 7th, 21st, and 28th of this month. Because we need to hear your stories. We need you to listen to the stories of one another. Thank you. All right, any questions or comments for Philip about the Racial Justice League? What happened to the little girl? Oh, that is a beautiful story in that um, it would have been a traumatic event. The police came and they did, they may have spoken to her, but they did not uh, confront her. But when the news got out, um, she has been honored by Yale University. Her collection of lantern flies has been put in their natural history museum. And the uh, um, the U.S. Natural History Museum has also honored her, and they have been able to turn this story around. But it is through the sharing of that story. It's a beautiful story that you can find in the New York Times yesterday. Thank you, Philip. I appreciate you sharing that with us. I, I do hope many of you will come out on Tuesday, February 7th to the, um, to the hut. It's at 5.30, right? Yes, sir. 5.30 uh, for an hour and a half of discussions and presentations and collaborations and storytelling. Susie.